Hello and welcome to the Aggression Unit. Across the next six videos, we're going to discuss biological, evolutionary and social psychological explanations for aggressive behaviour, as well as talk about what causes aggression in prisons. We'll also discuss if TV and computer games are resulting in real-world violence. In this first video, we're going to investigate neural and hormonal explanations for aggression. Let's get started. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. Neural and Hormonal Mechanisms in Aggression There are three distinct sections that I'm going to cover in this video, and even though they are separate, you'll see each of the explanations is related to the other two. So I'm going to give you basic information about each, a research evaluation for each, but also to make it easy to remember, general evaluations that apply to all three. Neural mechanisms are anything to do with the neuron or nerve cell, so that can be large structures that are collections of neurons, for example the limbic system, or it can be tiny chemicals that influence how neurons work in the brain, called neurotransmitters. And what we need to discuss in this video is serotonin. Hormonal mechanisms are also chemical, but they travel in the bloodstream altering the function of bodily processes. In this video we need to discuss testosterone. I'll give a quick definition of each before going into far more detail about how they influence aggression. The limbic system is a collection of neural structures deep in the centre of the brain. Two regions we're particularly interested in when it comes to aggression regulation are the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Serotonin is what's called an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it's vital for calming aggressive impulses. Testosterone is the male sex hormone. Another word for a male sex hormone is an androgen. So, as you might expect, it's found in greater quantities in males. And, as we tend to see greater aggression in males, it might be what's responsible. Limbic system. So we can see in this image a range of structures that make up the limbic system. One of the limbic system's roles is to process emotional information, including aggression. Even though it's made up from a wide range of structures, we only need to be aware of two, the amygdala and the hypothalamus. The amygdala is thought to be the origin of aggressive feelings and behaviours. And we do see an increased activity in this area when aggressive participants are measured with fMRI. A nearby region is the hypothalamus, and this brings together a range of emotions and is the part of the brain responsible for triggering the fight or flight response. Now a really important area of the brain that's not in the limbic system but is connected to this process is the orbitofrontal cortex. As it's a cortex, that means it's the outside surface or skin of the brain. And it's located at the front, just behind your forehead, so just there. It's a part of you that makes decisions. It can overrule aggressive impulses coming from the limbic system. If you've ever felt really angry and almost about to be aggressive, but managed to talk yourself down and stay in control, well, that's partly the work of the orbitofrontal cortex. Limbic system, evaluations. Early research by Egger and Flynn using cats showed that if you electrically stimulated an area of the hypothalamus, cats would suddenly be aggressive to rats placed in the cage. They also showed that stimulating some areas of the amygdala would increase that aggressive behaviour. But if a slightly different region of the amygdala was stimulated, the cats would be tame, showing no aggression. So this research really does suggest that areas of the limbic system are involved in the production of aggressive behaviour. But the relationship of the amygdala to aggressive behaviour is complex, potentially with different regions having different functions. But of course, this is cats, and you're probably thinking, well, how much could this possibly apply to humans? Now, we can't go around stimulating human amygdalas under experimental procedures, but we can look at interesting case studies. One report by Summer revealed extreme aggression in a 14-year-old girl who also had epileptic fits. Now, the girl was given an MRI, and this showed a tumour in her brain, and this tumour was pressed up right up against her amygdala. So, she had surgery, and fortunately it was complete success, with the fits disappearing, as well as return to normal aggression levels. Now, of course, this is highly suggestive that the tumour was stimulating her amygdala, resulting in the aggressive behaviour. But, as a case study, we have to be careful. It wasn't a carefully controlled experiment. There could have been other factors that we're just not aware of causing the aggression beyond just this tumour. Serotonin. So moving on to the neurotransmitter associated with aggression, serotonin. We need to state that serotonin's role is inhibitory, helping to reduce neuronal activity. Now it's thought that it works in the orbitofrontal cortex by helping to calm aggressive impulses that have been received from the amygdala. 
The serotonin deficiency hypothesis suggests that if levels of serotonin in the orbital frontal cortex is too low, then the orbital frontal cortex isn't able to control the aggressive impulses, resulting in aggression. We can measure the amount of serotonin in the brain by looking at levels of 5-HIAA in the spinal fluid. 5-HIAA is what serotonin is broken down into, and we see lower levels in the spines of aggressive people, which suggests these aggressive people have lower levels of serotonin in their brain. But in the next video, we're going to look at the genetic explanation and discuss a variation of the MOA gene that results in problems breaking down serotonin, resulting in too much serotonin in the brain. And these people can show aggressive behaviour. So we can certainly say the role serotonin has in regulating aggression is, well, complex and maybe not fully understood. Serotonin evaluations. Now, a cleverly designed study is by Passamonti. We need a compound called tryptophan for our bodies to synthesize serotonin. So Passamonte asked one group of participants to cut out foods with tryptophan from their diets. The other group ate normally. The tryptophan deprivation had the result of lowering serotonin in the brain of the experimental group. The researchers then used fMRI to see how the brain would respond to seeing angry faces. The results showed reduced communication between the orbital frontal cortex and the amygdala when participants were deprived of serotonin, suggesting the orbital frontal cortex was not able to regulate aggression in the amygdala when deprived of serotonin. Testosterone. And finally, the androgen testosterone. As the male sex hormone, it's generally found in levels eight times higher in males than females. It's what's responsible for the development of sex characteristics typical of males, so muscle development, body hair, that kind of thing. But psychologists are, of course, much more interested in behavioural changes as a result of increased testosterone. And one of the biggest behavioural differences between males and females is males show much higher levels of physical aggression. We can see evidence for this with the much larger number of males convicted of violent offences. How this is thought to work is that excessive amounts of testosterone in the orbital frontal cortex reduces its ability to regulate the aggression coming from the limbic system. With reduced executive function, the individual is more prone to emotional aggressive outbursts. It's also thought that high levels in the amygdala increases its activity, producing more aggression. And it's also thought there's an interaction between testosterone and serotonin, with high levels of testosterone reducing serotonin's ability to calm aggressive thoughts. Testosterone. Evaluations. An experiment by Wagner used mice. When observing mice, Wagner recorded the males as being more likely to aggressively bite than females. Wagner then castrated the mice, which is removing the testicles, reducing, in of course, a large drop in testosterone production. After castration, aggression levels in the males dropped to the same levels as the females. Then Wagner injected the male mice with testosterone, increasing the biting behaviour of the males back to the previous level. And when the females were injected, they became more aggressive like the males. Now, this experimental data is highly suggestive that the hormone testosterone does cause aggressive behaviour. Well, at least in mice. General evaluations. I think it's best if we finish with a set of evaluations that we can reword depending on the question. So if you're directly asked to write an essay on just one process or all three. Everything we've covered in this video is a biological explanation for aggression. Saying aggression is purely biological, well, we might feel this argument is a little bit too biologically reductionist. Now don't get me wrong, reductionism is good in some ways. A simple explanation is more open to scientific testing and can lead to effective treatments. But there are other persuasive social psychological explanations for aggression that we're going to cover in a few videos. Perhaps a full explanation for aggression is more holistic. Some people may be more biologically prone to aggression than others, but this isn't expressed unless they have other psychological experiences in their life. Now I'm showing examples of both reductionism and determinism evaluations here. Now, honestly, in a real exam situation, I'd recommend you don't use them both at the same time, as students often get them mixed up and there are lots of other great evaluations you can use. But I know about the confusion with these two. So I'm going to use them both here so you can see the difference between them when they're right next to each other. Taking a biologically deterministic approach to aggression is suggesting that someone couldn't act otherwise, so that their biology is their destiny. Well, that's a problem when talking about aggression. 
which of course is linked to violent crime. Are people destined to be violent criminals? If someone is a violent criminal and convicted of a serious assault or a murder, what if they've got very high levels of testosterone, very low levels of serotonin, or a limbic abnormality? Should we reduce their sentence, or even just let them go as long as they receive treatment? After all, they can't control any of those biological problems themselves. So you can see taking a biologically deterministic approach to aggression has some seriously problematic implications when applied in the real world. Kind of a link point is social sensitivity. This is the idea that research we conduct on people could negatively affect their lives and people like them. So if we find biological abnormalities in the limbic system are predictive of later violent crime, this could lead to arguments of intervention before these people commit an offence. Now, this might seem extreme, but it is a debate some prominent psychologists such as Adrian Rain are considering. But if this happens, will this just lead to another form of discrimination against people who have yet to commit an offence? And a final point. These studies we've looked at have all used carefully controlled biological measuring tools like fMRI and careful measurements of biological chemicals like serotonin and testosterone. This biological approach minimises much of the potential bias we see in other forms of psychology. So we can suggest that these studies have high internal validity. They tend to measure what they've intended to measure precisely. These four evaluations can all actually be used as evaluations for the topic of the next video, genetic factors and aggression. I'm not going to repeat them all there, but I'd suggest after watching that video, come back to this and think about how you could reword these points in an essay on genetic factors. This is a really valuable skill in your psychology A level, and just understanding these concepts and knowing how to use evaluations like these effectively, adapting them to the essay that you need to write, massively reduces the number of evaluations you have to memorise. Here is a real aggression exam question. Give it a go and see how you do. I want to thank everyone who supported the channel over on Patreon during the creation of the aggression unit. You're helping to make the development of these free A level videos possible. If you're a Psychboost patron at the neuron level and above, you can access six bonus aggression tutorial videos over on psychboost.com. And in them, I'll talk you through a model answer for the exam questions, and I'll share some general exam tips based on the exam reports. Sign-ups patrons and above can access a printable poster, a quiz sheet covering the aggression unit, and an essay table. Neuron can get a set of worksheets and the script to this video. I've designed all of them to work alongside these videos to make a complete set of notes and revision materials. But for everyone else, like and subscribe so you don't miss videos released right up to your exams. 